At this, the Jews began to grumble, grumble about Jesus because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up with the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who's heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that has come down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died. But whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in a synagogue in Capernaum. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Dearly loved people of God, Jesus makes some really surprising statements. Though some of us have heard these again and again and again, and they don't jump off the page, they don't shock us the way they would if we had heard them for the first time. But he said, I am the bread of life. Really? Who compares themselves to a loaf of bread? I mean, think about this for a second. This doesn't happen all the time. How about this? Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. I mean, that's a shocking statement to say. It's kind of gross, actually. And then there's this one. My flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. I mean, people get arrested for drinking blood. Human blood, at least. What does it mean, then? When Jesus is standing there in Capernaum, and he's talking to the Jewish people. And he says, I am the bread of life. A bread is a staple in many, many cultures. I'm sure you're aware of this. Especially around the Mediterranean. Bread gets served at every single meal. And sometimes bread starts to sound a little bland, doesn't it? Compared to all the other things that you can eat, bread by itself sometimes sounds really, really boring. And so then there's these people that make their sandwiches and they put that bread under globs and globs of peanut butter. So you almost can't see the bread anymore. Or you pile on the bacon and the lettuce and the tomatoes and then put that between two thin slices of bread. Or you put the chocolate sprinkles, really, really thick. But first you put the butter on really thickly so all those sprinkles stay down. Because my dad's rule was if you turn the piece of bread over when it had chocolate sprinkles and anything that fell off was obviously way too much. Bread, we don't even think about that compared to the stuff that goes inside the sandwiches to eat. 
But when you're really, really hungry, when you're just coming out of the flu, the thought of a piece of bread, even a piece of toast, singed bread, sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Consider the context of what Jesus is talking about when he says, I am the bread of life. Like I said, we, we read this a couple weeks ago as we were going through the Gospel of John. But he had just fed the 5,000 in the wilderness. They had been hungry, and Jesus had taken those loaves, and he had broken them, had distributed them, and everybody had enough to eat from those bread and those fish. And this is, fits into the pattern we've identified in the Gospel of John, that the event happens... And then Jesus talks about it. There's a discourse that follows, a dialogue, a conversation that follows, in which Jesus picks up on some of the themes of what he has just done. And so he's just fed them bread in the wilderness. That wilderness meal makes all these connections, and Jesus makes some of them explicit when he starts talking about the manna that people ate in the wilderness, and yet they still died in the wilderness. Jesus is making those connections in order to make his point about himself being the bread of life. And all through the Gospel, according to John, there's a theme of the Passover that runs through the whole thing. So whether it's the very beginning where Jesus is identified by John the baptizer, look, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, or whether he's talking about himself being bread, or he's going to the temple three times in John's Gospel to celebrate the Passover. There's always that theme that the Passover meal is kind of behind the background. And we kind of hear the overtones of that throughout the whole Gospel. And yet, for all of that, it's kind of funny because John's Gospel of the four is the only one where we don't see Jesus sit down around the Lord's Supper table and have a Last Supper with his disciples and institute the Lord's Supper celebration. Matthew tells about it. That tells us about it. Mark tells about it. Luke tells about it. John, no Last Supper. Maybe because this is the last gospel to be written. That a lot of the people had read through Matthew and Mark and Luke already, and they were used to the habits of worshiping in a Christian church where they regularly broke bread together and drank the cup together, where they regularly remembered and believed through the Lord's Supper celebration. That John said he didn't need to tell about an institution of the Lord's Supper. And yet you can't read John chapter 6 and all the allusions to Jesus' bread, body being the bread and his blood being you know, the drink without thinking about the Lord's Supper and our celebration of that celebration feast. Jesus presents himself as the bread of life, the main source of nourishment for human life, a staple in our diet. By eating Jesus' bread as bread, our faith grows, and is nourished. And we're affirmed as God's dearly loved people. Don't get the order wrong here. Jesus is the nourishment. The Lord's Supper is one of the ways that believers receive Jesus' goodness, His grace, and the life that He offers so freely through Himself. The Lord's Supper is an important sign, an important seal, but only in the, so far as the Lord's Supper points us to Jesus Christ and what He has done for us. Jesus is the nourishment. This is the pointers, the sign and the seal of what He has done. Jesus is the one who gives life. Jesus is the one who sustains our life every single day, allows us to keep on going, even to keep on growing regularly. The Lord's Supper is one of the ways that we receive that, that we're reminded of, that becomes tangible 
that the words on the page that Jesus says become something we can feel and taste and touch and smell. Jesus said he is the bread of life. And went on to say, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Very truly is the translation, the NIV, from the Hebrew words, Amen, Amen. And the Hebrew gets retained in the Greek New Testament that Jesus actually says, Amen, Amen, and John recorded that. What does Amen mean again? Anybody remember what Amen? What does Amen mean? So be it. Absolutely. This is true. You can bank on this stuff. Amen. Amen. I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in him. So what's the significance then of Jesus' body and his blood? Well, his words and these visuals at the Lord's Supper table are tangible reminders, touchable reminders. Reminders of the punishment for sin is always death. Blood needs to flow to cover over sin, to atone, cover over sin and guilt. And so what sin then? Well, sin is disobedience, isn't it? God's you shall not command. They're not designed to ruin our fun, to ruin our day, to be a killjoy. Now God's instructions, His guidelines for life, promote life. They promote healthy relationships. And even more than you shall not, God said you shall. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. When you don't, when you don't love God, when you don't love your neighbor, those relationships break down. When we don't love God, we, we cut ourselves off from God. The relationship gets broken. When we don't love our neighbor, the, the relationship breaks down. The, the walls go up or, or the, the bridges break down and we can't get back and forth anymore. To be cut off from God is to be cut off from the source of life. To be cut off from God is, well, in some ways, it's to die. Which is what hell essentially is. To be cut off from all the grace, all the, all the goodness, all the love of God. And to be present with his anger at human sin. To be cut off from family, to be cut off from friends. Also in a way is, is to die. To, to, to shrivel up and just to be alone. I've heard widowed people say this before. How difficult it is. And even if you get together with family, that at the end of the day, you walk into your own apartment, to your own house, at the end of the day, it's just you. For some, that's really hard. To be alone. To be alone eternally is eternal death. <coughs> Thinking about that gets kind of uncomfortable. Right? Judge your own success. I haven't always loved God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I haven't always loved my neighbor as myself. Even when I try really, really hard, I still fall short. And because God is just, because God is holy, He can't ignore that. That wouldn't be just anymore. Sin always needs to be punished. It always needs to be dealt with. And so in His grace, in His love, in His mercy, God became human to deal with sin and life and, and death. Jesus is the Son of God who came to deal with our sin. He took human punishment on Himself. In His own flesh and blood, He was beaten and crucified and left to hang until he wasn't breathing anymore. He took human punishment for sin upon himself and died on the cross. And the Lord's Supper reminds us of that. The Lord's Supper brings us to the foot of the cross so that we can hold his body and see his blood. 
eat his body, drink his blood. Because his blood <laughs> covers over human guilt, it covers over human sin, and it washes us clean as if we had never sinned or been a sinner. Eating that bread and drinking that cup at the Lord's supper table is our participation in Jesus' atoning sacrifice. By eating and drinking, we share in all the benefits of his death and resurrection. His death frees us from guilt and it frees us from sin. It frees us from death. Death no longer has a hold on us because Christ died the death that we deserve. And has built those bridges again between us and his Father, between us and each other. And that's why we don't celebrate the Lord's Supper alone. We celebrate it with the whole company of other believers because those bridges are open again. The walls have come down. We're able to enjoy, to love each other. <clears throat> Some of us are just beginning to appreciate the truth, the significance of what Jesus has done. Maybe that's where you're at in your state of faith in life. That your appreciation, your, your faith is still relatively new and, and you're still growing in it. You're reflecting on God's grace and His mercy and it gives life and vigor to your activities. Maybe you're in a season of your life where that enthusiasm and your growth is really, really high. You can't wait to read another chapter of the Bible that God's Word is refreshing to you as a glass of water on a hot day. It's as nourishing as a sandwich when you're really, really hungry. If that's the case, then read and read and read and soak it up. Fill your mind, your heart with God's word because it's there as you chew that over that you encounter Jesus, the Savior. God and all of his love and his holiness and his goodness. But maybe you're not at that stage of life and growth and faith right now. Maybe you're not even sure what, what you believe. Maybe you're searching still for meaning and purpose and whether Jesus is real or not. Or maybe you're in a stage of life where this seems like you're stuck. Like daily devotions and coming to church become bland and boring like a stale sandwich you had for lunch. Same old bread, day in, day out, for years and years. You're even wondering if hearing from Jesus is nutritious anymore. How do you return to the enthusiasm that you had earlier in your journey of faith? If you're stuck and there seems to be nothing to push you out of the rut that you're stuck in. That's where we encounter Jesus' reassurance. My flesh is real food. My blood is real drink. He's the real deal. He's the one who gives real nourishment, who gives real faith. When we come to the Lord's Supper table, it's new and it's fresh, and it gives nourishment and enthusiasm once again for what He's done. We're confronted with the reality of who He is and what He's done. And Jesus mentions this man in the wilderness. What was man again? Do you recall? The word means what is it? So what is man and what is, what is it? A manna was found six days a week on the ground outside the camp when the Israelites lived in the wilderness for 40 years. This is how it got described, white like coriander seed. I found coriander seeds, and I don't know, maybe they were different back then, but these ones look brown to me. But it was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey. When the psalmist talks about manna in the wilderness, he calls it the bread of angels. This is from Psalm 78. Yet God gave a command to the skies above and opened the doors of the heavens. He rained down manna for the people to eat. He gave them the grain of heaven. Human beings ate the bread of angels. He sent them all the food they could eat. And why did God send this manna? Why did he send it? The obvious answer is, well, they were hungry. And there wasn't a grocery store at Mount Sinai. And so somewhere in the wilderness they needed to have food and God miraculously provided food for them every single day for 40 years. 
Another answer gets given in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Maybe you've never thought of it this way before, but this is what God explains in Deuteronomy chapter 8. He said, He humbled you. This is Moses telling the Israelites. God humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with man, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone. You don't just live on bread. But you live on every word that comes from the mouth of God, of the Lord. Manna taught the people for 40 years in the wilderness that they had to depend on God for everything. Life comes from God. Life comes from every word from the Lord's mouth. In John's Gospel, Jesus is introduced in chapter 1 as the Word of God. And here Jesus calls himself the bread of life. Jesus gives life to everyone who puts their faith in him. He is the nourishment that keeps us alive. We're invited daily to depend on Jesus, to encounter the Word of God that gives life. And so reading the Bible isn't just a matter of, okay, I did that, I get to check that off the list of my to-do list today. Sometimes that helps us stay on track. But that's not the purpose of it. The idea behind devotions is to depend on God for direction, to depend on Jesus for sustenance, to, to give you the ability to continue through the day. To read God's Word is supposed to give you life. And sometimes we become really formal with our idea about devotions. And so it's really refreshing. I don't know if it struck you if you read The Shack or not. But The Shack is a story in which a man in the woods gets to eat and drink with God. And Jesus is there, along with Papa and the Spirit. And they pause before one meal to do devotions. And Jesus turns to Papa and holds the hand. He says, Papa, I just want you to know how much I really love you and appreciate you. It's like, what did we think devotions was all about? <clears throat> Jesus, in that story, telling Papa how much Love there was between the two of them. Is that what devotions at mealtime or bedtime or whenever you, is that what it's like? For you to, to tell God, you know what, I, I, I really love you, you're amazing. Or for you to hear from God the Father, my dear, dear child, I love you so much. That gives life, doesn't it? When we encounter God's love by reading the words that come from the mouth of the Lord and are reminded in His love He doesn't want you to go down the wrong paths. In His love He wants you to be loving to other people. In His love He's given you life and hope and future. Wow! That's kind of exciting. Meeting with Jesus like this, whether reading from the Bible or encountering Him at the Lord's Supper, reminds us what's truly important. It puts everything into, into perspective once again. I mean, too often our hopes and our dreams, our aspirations, get shaped by the standards of what success looks like in the rest of the world. What we see on social media, or what we see in the media. So that instead of modeling our picture of what I want to be when I grow up, what, what success would look like if I am good at what I do, on the truth that's in Jesus. It even happens sometimes in church life, doesn't it? That it gets tiring. Another task, another meeting to go to. Sometimes another whole evening invested into ministry and service. It feels like it sucks us dry instead of giving life. And dealing with this renovation part, uh, project, which we've been doing for over a year now, that can get draining too. 
I see it on some of the committee members and some of the people that are working hard at it. It's been over a year since we knocked down that first wall, and it's still not quite yet finished. We're getting there. But everybody's enthusiasm seems to flag a little bit and be at low ebb as we're almost there, but not quite. But we're not primarily building a building with a building project. This building is a tool in our mission. This building is a tool that we feel God's called us to, to fix up and renovate and freshen so that we can build more and better disciples. We can build up the kingdom of God so we can hear and celebrate and proclaim who Jesus is, what he's done. So we become more alive in our faith by, by being together and loving each other and, and being that family of God together. So we can break bread, both at the Lord's Supper table and out in the fellowship hall with a, a feast or a celebration. Because we are followers of Jesus Christ. We are hungering and thirsting for the real food that he offers, that he gives. And so we tell and we retell and we tell all over again the story of what Jesus has done for us. What Jesus has done for the whole world. Because we have good news. We have found real food. Our family and our neighbors can find that food and that drink, can find real life by putting their faith in Jesus as well. We're not just here to pass that message along. If we don't eat and we don't drink and we don't find nourishment in life in the Word of God, then we're missing the boat. If you don't think that Jesus is the best thing, better even than sliced bread, you got to stop and taste the bread of life all over again. Take the time to chew it over, to, to mull on it. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, said Jesus. And I, Jesus, will remain in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live Sometimes so off putting, isn't it? To eat his body, drink his blood. But taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that goodness of the Lord through Jesus' word. Because every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord gives life. And having been united with Jesus like this, don't give in to other stuff. Don't give in to temptation. Don't look for life for joy, for purpose anywhere else. Don't accept any substitute. Find life in Jesus, in his message, in imitating his example. Can I tell you how that worked for Amanda? I think I've told you the story before. But Amanda was a member in Fredericton. And she gave me permission to tell her story, so I will. When she was invited to be part of the renewal team that we had started there, it was a big ask, she found. Because one of the things that we asked, in addition to regular meetings, in addition to giving some thought and prayer about stuff, we, we invited those in the inner circle of this to, to read their Bible every single day. She said, well, that's a, that's a big ask, actually. I don't, I'm not in the habit of doing that yet. But if that's what this is going to take, well, okay, I'll do it, she said. And she said that that gave her life. Because prior to that, Amanda said, I always thought of myself as a good girl, that I'd always kind of done what I was supposed to do. I knew how to live life, so I didn't raise a lot of problems. But, but by reading the Bible every day, I came to the fact that I was a sinner, and I had needed to be forgiven for that sin. And by reading scripture, she said, I found that Jesus forgives sin by his death and resurrection. By reading scripture, I found that though I didn't quite measure up to the goodness that God demands, his Holy Spirit comes into me and allows me to live that way now. Not perfectly yet. And Amanda was so excited about 
this, that she started a Facebook group with her other friends and members of her Bible study and said, guess what, we're going to read a Bible passage every single day. I'm going to post it in Facebook. And in our private group, I expect each of you to at least one word of response after you've read that passage so that we can keep each other accountable for reading it. And so that, that group did. And that group of ladies read the Bible together, and usually it wasn't just one word, but a paragraph or something in response to say, this is what it means, and this is how I feel God's calling us to shape it. And her friend, her siblings, got decided about what she was doing. And she came from a big family, so she started another private Facebook group. And she put the Bible passage there, and all of her siblings then chimed in. They read the Bible together. Eventually, she had three different groups like that. Amanda got so excited about reading God's Word because it gave her life. Because it connected her with Jesus Christ. And every mouth that comes from the Word of God, every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord, gives life. And so as we eat and drink in two weeks, and as we open the Bible each day, there's a, day, a reading guide if you're interested in it, emailed or a hard copy. God's Word gives life. Let's bask in it. Let's chew it over. 